Okay, good morning again to everybody and welcome to our Monday plenary. And we're going to begin our coverage of John Stuart Mill this morning, uh, who is the final philosopher in this group on, on ethics and one whom I'm sure you're going to find very relevant uh, to our contemporary times as he wrote uh, his works uh, uh, during the uh, mid to latter part of the 19th century. And just really one of the first uh, philosophers whom we would call progressive uh, in his moral thinking, not necessarily his political views, but certainly in his moral and social philosophy, and, and to a certain extent, politics also. So uh, before we go to Mill, I just want to ask you all a question about Kant. I've already canvassed the group uh, as to whether you have any questions about Kant. No one raised anything. So let me ask you a question about Kant. And this is, uh, there's an ulterior motive. Uh, behind this question. Uh, you, you all know that we've seen thus far um, strengths as well as weaknesses of each of the philosophers we've covered in terms of their ethics. Yes, every ethical theory has strengths and, and obviously some weaknesses too. And it seems so far we haven't seen any perfect theories. So uh, as far as Kant is concerned, um, I guess you understand his strength and his strength uh, is the strength of all deontological systems in general, and that is there's, there are rules uh, that you can follow when in doubt or when seeking moral guidance. In Kant's particular case, it's not a set of rules, it's rather a meta rule for testing whether a given moral rule should or should not be followed, namely the categorical imperative. And that's a, certainly a strength, as you can subject any reasonable moral question to that test. Um, so what about weaknesses? Well, we saw more generally in deontological systems um, that rules always have exceptions. I mean, Kant finesses this because the, uh, the perfect duties in his system have no exceptions. The categorical imperative has really no exceptions. Uh, so uh, there may be, the, however, another kind of weakness we can identify, and it's, uh, it's not Kant's fault. Uh, since Kant's ethics are very logical, the weakness itself is going to be logical. Uh, so I just want to ask you a question by way of pointing this out, and then we'll, we'll move on to Mill. So here's my question to you, and just just type in a yes or no um, in the in the chat room, okay, if you please. Um, do you think, my question to you is, do you think that the world would be a better place if nobody lied, cheated, stole, killed, uh, and so forth? Do you think the world would be a better place? No. <laughs> you think the world would be a worse place? Maybe you haven't understood the question. If I'm saying to you, if people did not, under any conditions, lie, cheat, steal, murder, commit adultery, and all those things, would the world be a better place? Now, many of you are understanding the question. You're saying yes. Okay, I'd phrased it in the in the negative, and I'm phrasing it as it's it's a same logical question. Okay, so you still think no? All right, Aisha, that's interesting, um, and uh, and I'd be curious to know why. Boring place, yes. Okay, boring place. So I see many of you um, are you you can take the fifth on this if there are in the room this morning. Uh, people who 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 themselves prefer to lie, cheat, steal, <laughs> kill, uh, commit adultery, and what have you, um, you, certainly you can take the fifth. Um, I think a majority would agree that the world would be a better place. Um, but uh, again, that's just a question, and there, you know I'm not compelling any answer at all. Uh, let me ask you then the second half, the flip side of the question: Do you think the world would be a better place? If, if everybody had uh, autonomy um, and dignity, if everyone both had, both had autonomy within their ability to handle it, and also were treated with dignity, uh, would the world be a better place? All right, a bunch of yeses on that. Uh, okay, so everyone is a bigger fan of autonomy and dignity. I don't see any objections. Okay, fair enough. So what you realize what I've asked you in essence is if the world would be a better place if everyone were Kantian, right? If everyone were practicing Kant's categorical imperative, both formulations, right? Would the world be a better place? And most of you at least are willing to imagine that a Kantian world, uh, it really would be a better place. And certainly that, that's Kant's point of view, obviously. Uh, so what's the problem? Why don't we have a Kantian world? And uh, and you see, this is an interesting, it's an interesting question. Um, if 
how could we compel people to be Kantian? The short answer is we can't. People would have to, that's right, you, Ahmed, and some of you are bringing up this matter of free will, and that's exactly what it hinges on. Very good for you. You have your thinking caps on this morning. You see, people would have to choose, right, by their own free will, um, to, they would have to will freely uh, for uh, their maxim to be a universal law, right? If they were Kantians, if you were a Kantian, you'd be saying, uh, you know, that by your own free will. Uh, yes, you, you will that this uh, maxim that informs the action you're about to take uh, would be a universal law. That's, that's the categorical imperative. Um, if someone coerced you into adopting that maxim, then you wouldn't be willing it freely, all right? And so you couldn't be coerced without violating the maxim itself. Because if you were coerced into adopting the categorical imperative, you would not be willing it freely. And so it would, as a meta maxim, defeat itself as well. So no one could coerce you, therefore, into being Kantian without violating Kant's own rule. You see this? So that's a weakness of the system. We can't really coerce people into being Kantian. And Kant would probably agree. I would like to think Kant would agree with that. So people would have to voluntarily choose to be Kantian. Okay, is that clear? All right, I hope so. Um, so, um, well, it wouldn't limit free will. No, Ahmed, a Kantian world doesn't limit free will. Because remember, uh, you're going to act on that maxim such that you can will that it be a universal law. You're going to act only uh, and on all those maxims such that you can will that they be universal law. So please don't misunderstand this. No one's limiting your free will. If you're freely choosing to act on this maxim, it is your free will. So, so a Kantian world doesn't limit free will at all. It's just a world in which everyone freely chooses to act only on those maxims, which they can will freely to be universal law. So please don't, don't misunderstand. That's the vital point. I know I've risked now perhaps confusing you all, but this question is also, in a sense, a test of, of how well you understand Kant's maxim. Again, act only on that maxim such that you can will it to be a universal law presumes your free will in freely choosing to act on it, all right? And freely willing it to be a universal law. And seeing that the maxim doesn't contradict itself, you have a duty, of course, to act on it. But none of this is contrary to free will. In fact, it presupposes free will. What I'm saying is that if everyone were Kantian, the world would probably be a better place. I'm not saying everyone is Kantian. I'm saying most people probably aren't Kantian. Uh, because most people will have some price at which they're willing to sell their souls and violate his categorical imperative, even though they know it's probably wrong, they're still going to be tempted. So, I mean, that's the Hobbesian world, yeah? But basically, um, what I'm suggesting to you is, although the world, I think, would be a far better place if everyone were Kantian, there are really very few Kantians around. So how could we get everyone to be more Kantian? Well, we'd have to either convince them by rational argument, which uh, both Hobbes and uh, Hume give us very good reasons to suppose would fail, or we would coerce them into being Kantian. And I'm saying, would I'm asking you, would that work? And, and the answer is no, and Kant's own answer would be no, because if we coerced everybody into acting only on that maxim such that you could will it to be a universal law, you'd no, you'd no longer be willing it to be a universal law. You'd be coerced into willing it to be a universal law, and therefore it would contradict your freedom of choice. So you can't coerce anybody. You can't make people Kantian by putting a gun to their heads, okay? Um, so, uh, so you see, that's the sort of logical weakness in, in Kant's theory is that we cannot compel anybody to adopt it. And it's, it's a very interesting point that I just thought I'd bring up in passing. Okay. All right. I wouldn't go so far as to say there'd be no individuality. I mean, we can all be artists uh, <laughs> and create quite freely without, without necessarily being constrained by Kant's maxim. Kant's maxim is a moral maxim and it's not making any pronouncement on your individuality or the things that make you individual. Do you think that uh, being a criminal makes you individual? Well, that would violate Kant's maxim. But if you think that entering a career of your choice uh, and, you know, or, or a calling of your choice and practicing it um, with, um, with some kind of um, ethical uh, guidance and a moral compass uh, 
uh, makes you uh, not an individual. No, of course it makes you more of an individual. Uh, so anyway, I'm glad this has provoked uh, some discussion. And uh, so it's a little bit of food for thought in any case that we can't coerce people into being Kantian without violating Kant's maxim itself. And that was my, that was my point, okay? Um, Ahmed asks, uh, isn't lying in a society like one we live in necessary? Uh, well, I, I don't know. Are there necessary laws? Give me an example of a necessary lie, Ahmed. I mean, politicians necessarily lie. All of them do, especially during election uh, times when they make promises unless they can keep them. Um, lying to save lives. How does lying save lives, David? Could you give me an example of how lying would save a life? Sir, Professor, can I speak? Yes, please. Okay. So, for example, like, say, for example, you're married or you have kids or you're in front of your boss and your boss asks you if you like his new suit. If we're in a Kantian world, then you would say no. It's horrible. But in the world we live in, that we would say, I think it looks nice or I think it looks okay. You should ask someone else. If we constantly talk, I'm not talking about big lies. I'm talking about the very small lies that everyone tells each other. Yeah. To yeah. keep somebody okay. going. If we yeah, we call them yeah, we call them little white lies in English, right? Supposed to distinguish them from bigger and more and more uh, significant lies. But uh, in a Kantian world, uh, your boss. Remember, in a Kantian world, your boss wouldn't mind you telling. Would, would in fact respect you for telling the truth because your boss would also respect your autonomy and dignity and would not merely want to have false compliments paid. Right? Someone who's flattered by false compliments is very unKantian, also. So, uh, I mean, in the real world, maybe, and even closer to home, I suppose, even closer to home, you know, sometimes your, your significant other may ask you, how do I look? You know, your significant other may get all dressed up for a social occasion and say, how do I look? And then you better say you look nice, right? Because if you say something else, it might, you know, it might prompt a quarrel. So that's also a small lie, which sometimes can be presumably uh, in the service of maintaining a relationship. But in any case, uh, yeah, so I can understand that point where basically people are fishing for compliments, okay? But fishing for a compliment is itself insincere, okay? You understand if you're fishing, if you ask somebody, do you like this suit or how do I look? You're fishing for a compliment. And if you're fishing for a compliment, that's also in a certain sense uh, untruthful or insincere. So anyway, I see the practicality of it, but I don't think we could ever will it to be a universal law under Kant's system, certainly not. Okay, well, then, then David gives the hypothetical example of the axe murderer. Well, I, I think I already told you, um, and I, I forget which philosopher it was who, who was being assassinated. Uh, was it Epicurus? I can't remember which ancient philosopher. Uh, I think it, it was Archimedes, it was somebody. Um, and uh, my memory's failing me this morning. But in any case, the, these murderers broke into his house looking for him, and they didn't have a photo in those days. There were no photos, so they just said, "Is is so and so nearby?" Um, and um, and and uh, so where are you? They said, "Are you?" So, you know, the one they were looking for, right to kill. They said, "Are you?" Uh, uh, or where is um, Epicurus or whoever it was they were trying to kill? And his response was, "Not far away." And I think he's nearby. So they all they all went off looking for him. Um, and this guy, therefore, didn't have to lie in order to save his life. OK, um, saying some saving someone from a suicide by lying. Um, well, that sounds pretty hypothetical, Steen. Also, what, what, how would you save someone from suicide by lying to them? How might you do that? I'm just going to unmute myself. Um, I'm not sure. Um, I would say, I mean, I, since it's a hypothetical situation, I would say maybe um, also telling them something that maybe isn't true, but just in the case that they would, you know, commit suicide because of, you know, the actual truth. So you would just tell them otherwise, you know. All right. Well, Ahmed's trying to give you a help, help you out here you could tell them that life is worth living when maybe it's not well excuse me who are we to, Ahmed, who are we to judge whether someone else's life is worth living or not pardon me okay i mean there's something i mean kant would maybe disagree with rational suicide that is people who who are willing to end their lives 
um, because they're maybe terminally ill and in pain and there's no cure. So, you know, physician assisted suicide may be a rational choice and that would be contrary to Kant, but I could probably find myself defending it in some cases as well, contrary to Kant or not. But lying to someone's different, it's a, it's a different matter. It's a very different matter. Um, if it's something you believe, would it be a lie? Um, well, if, it, if you believe that your life is, uh, is, is not worth living when maybe it is, it's not a lie that you're telling yourself. It may be simply a false belief. A false belief is not a lie. A lie is something that someone else tells you, um, which is an untruth that they expect you to accept as a truth. It's a completely different story, Dahlia, an excellent point you're raising, but a completely different story that people may in fact harbor false beliefs Okay, harboring a false belief that you believe to be true is not a lie. It's a false belief, right? If someone tells you something untrue and wants you to accept it as true, then certainly that's a lie. But we all may have, we're all self-deceived to a certain extent, right? All of us may harbor uh, partly false or, or misleading or, in fact, flat out wrong, incorrect beliefs about our own selves. But those that aren't lies, those are false beliefs. And there's a difference, okay? So believing something isn't necessarily a lie. Uh, you may have true beliefs or you may have false beliefs, okay? But in no case are any of those things lies, right? That's a different, different category. All right, fair enough, you're welcome. I'm glad you're all thinking this morning since you all are wearing your thinking caps. Uh, I think we're gonna move on, uh, but uh, Khan is certainly one who can provoke some interesting discussion. Uh, about these in categorical imperatives and possible exceptions that you <laughs> that you yourselves may want to contemplate. Okay, let's move on to John Stuart Mill, uh, our final moral philosopher in this section of the course. And Mill is really uh, a kind of a hero uh, to me, and 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 I'm certainly not alone because he was someone who not only talked the talk but also walked the walk. He was a very brilliant child. He was a kind of a child prodigy as far as learning, not, not with respect to a musical instrument or something like that, but um, he was very precocious with languages and his parents noticed this. And apparently by age three or four, he was reading Latin and Greek fluently in addition to English. So he was obviously a, a kind of a prodigy with language. And he was also a very brilliant, very brilliant child. Um, this led him to, I think, had a nervous breakdown sometime in his teens, which is quite common for, for brilliant children. But in any case, he went on uh, to become a great exponent and probably the greatest exponent of utilitarianism, which is a branch of consequentialist philosophy, a main branch, yes? And now we're going to contrast deontology with a consequentialism. Remember, if deontology says that the rightness uh, or wrongness of an act um, is not or not at all dependent on its consequences, rather on the intention and the rule that's followed. Yeah, that's for deontologists. Uh, teleologists or consequentialists will assert the, the, the opposite, that in fact, the rightness or wrongness of an act depends or depends exclusively on the outcome that you get. So in other words, if you got a good result, you did the right thing. If you got a bad result, you did the wrong thing. That's the general maxim for consequentialism or teleology. And a particular uh, family of that, uh, or rather uh, a member of that family is utilitarianism. And Mill is the most responsible for uh, promoting utilitarianism as a moral theory. And it's he who reformed the earlier version by his mentor, Jeremy Bentham, which uh, attracted a specific kind of criticism at which we're going to look shortly, okay? So Mill um, is, is an advocate of what's sometimes called the greatest happiness idea. You know, the bumper sticker for Mill would be the greatest happiness for the greatest number, so that justice, in fact, would consist on the greatest happiness for the greatest possible number, with some important qualifications that we'll come to. So that's the idea of utilitarianism. But to understand Mill's utilitarianism, not only how it differs from Bentham, which we're going to cover this morning, but significantly um, how it responds to another very damning, potentially damning criticism, namely that utilitarianism does not respect individual rights. And that's a criticism that has been levied and can be levied against some versions of it. 
So to, to fully appreciate Mill's defense of utilitarianism, we also have to appreciate how he answers that criticism, and he does, and he does it in a separate essay called On Liberty. And it turns out that that essay actually preceded his, his big fat book on utilitarianism, just to underscore the importance he places on individual liberty. Because in Mill's conception of things, it would be impossible to achieve the greatest happiness for the greatest number, unless you had at the same time, uh, the greatest liberty for the greatest number or potentially for everybody. So that's why he insists on individual liberty being a cornerstone of his utilitarian theory. And that's how he answers the charge that utilitarianism may override or disregard or violate individual rights. And therefore that would be a big flaw in it as a moral theory, right? So I'm going to try to explain that much this morning. And then the third plank, so you need to understand really three things about Mill. Um, and the third thing, you know, there's this, his view of, of individual liberty, his view of utilitarianism, and thirdly, his view of women's liberation, of which he was one of the most effective exponents. And he produced a book in 1869, called The Subjection of Women, which was really co-authored between the lines by his wife, Harriet Taylor, um, a, a great philosopher in her own right, who, who was not at that time permitted to publish. Women were still in Victorian England, uh, not uh, really allowed to publish things because of the constraints of the time and the lack of liberty, you would say. Um, so Mill was an advocate and a very strong advocate I will repeat the view, Stacey, but Mill was a very strong advocate um, of uh, what we today call uh, gender equality, but it, it, he, he called it the, uh, you know, basically the equality of women, social and political equality of women in society. And that was uh, in a book published 1869. It still took 50 more years for women to get the vote in England, no, notwithstanding the tremendous influence that Mill had, it still took 50 more years for it to take political effect, okay? So those are three things you need to understand because obviously if we're talking about the greatest happiness principle, which is Mill's utilitarian principle, the greatest happiness for the greatest number is what amounts to social justice for Mill, then you can't possibly have the greatest happiness for the greatest number if, if, if women don't have the same rights as men, he argued, because obviously women comprise more than half the population, normally 52 to 54% of the population. And so that's a majority already. Um, so if you disenfranchise a majority, uh, you can't possibly have the greatest happiness of the greatest number. Are we clear? Some of you are answering the, the question here, the three views. Yeah, so the main view uh, that Mill is famous for, well, one of the two main views is utilitarianism, namely the greatest happiness for the greatest number. We'll talk about happiness in a moment and what that means to Mill. But in order to have the greatest happiness for the greatest number, Mill is going to support that utilitarian theory with two very important books which actually his utilitarianism is sandwiched between, namely on liberty, the idea that individual liberty is essential to a person's happiness and therefore to overall happiness. You can't have the greatest happiness for the greatest number if the greatest number doesn't enjoy liberty, because that's inimical. A lack of liberty is, is going to cause unhappiness, not happiness. And secondly, and import, equally importantly, that the greatest happiness of the greatest number depends on everybody having liberty. And in Mill's time, that included uh, women who did not have the same liberties as men. So basically, his, his argument is really in three parts, that utilitarianism is what we want, greatest happiness for the greatest number. But in order to achieve that, we also need Without any uh, qualification, we, we need to defend individual liberty, no exceptions. And he'll talk about that in his essay on liberty. And, and also we have to have uh, the full participation of women in social and political life uh, equal to that of men. And so that's three, three parts of his moral theory and also his social and political theory. And that's what I want to look at. And I, so I said to you last week, uh, you need to read more to get Mill um, you're going to have to read these things, or at least extracts, if you really want to understand what Mill is saying and why. It's important to read not only the extracts from utilitarianism, 
which are in your textbook. And we're going to look at that in a moment. But it's equally important that you read extracts, at least from his essay on liberty, and also extracts from The Subjection of Women, where he calls for these two other measures. Okay, And that together will form uh, a more complete picture of uh, why Mill advocates utilitarianism itself. All right. So the, the, the plan this morning is to look at utilitarianism first, and then we're going to raise and answer two objections to it. Um, and in answering the second objection, we'll start to look at On Liberty and see the importance of that book. And then on Thursday in our breakout uh, group, we'll, we'll continue with On Liberty and also look at the subjection of women. I've uploaded those two works into your Google Drive folder, okay? And hopefully your instructors have shared those materials with you, okay? So utilitarianism is in your text on liberty, at least extracts from on liberty and the subjection of women uh, are in your Google Drive folders and they're all online. I mean, Mill, Mill's works have been reproduced umpteen times. They're all public domain and he's a very important philosopher. So. You can easily find them in law, online if you want to do more research, all right? So just to understand the timeline that in 1859, he produced the essay on liberty, followed up in 1861 by his book on utilitarianism, followed up in 1869 by his book on the subjection of women. So basically that decade, 1859 to 1869, encompasses these three works. He also wrote on logic. He also wrote on, on many other topics. And, and not only that, but uh, he served in parliament. He stood for and was elected, I think, twice to uh, serve in the British parliament and was instrumental uh, in bringing about legislative change. Prison reform and child labor laws and so forth were things that were under quite a lot of reform at this time. Uh, and that was partly due to the influence of Mill. So he was also a, uh, a social and political activist, not just a philosopher. So he led a very full life entering the, the domain of politics uh, in order to implement some of the policies uh, that philosophically he wrote about and wanted to see enshrined in law. OK, so uh, very, very important person in his time and his influence endures uh, certainly to this day. Uh, not only that. Um, but, uh, uh, well, he, 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 he will just, we'll just leave it there. He, he was a very important philosopher. Okay. And that's why he's included in this, in this group, uh, in our overview of ethics. So, uh, without further ado, then let's jump to extracts from utilitarianism. Are there any questions about what I've just said? Is everybody okay with that? I have a question. Um, yes, sir. Um, so in terms of like, what would his decision would be if uh, for abortions, like, would he say that it's a choice, but first we have to develop um, liberty for women or like, but it's like different now. Does that make sense? Yes. So this is a debate which did not arise much in his time um, because uh, the, there was a, a tremendous uh, uh, I think a social disapproval of unwanted pregnancy and women were much more terrified of getting pregnant in those days that there was no reliable contraception, right? So uh, it, it was for women a much bigger risk and potentially could ruin their lives and abortions were not legal. So they had to be performed in the most awful imaginable conditions, you know, by people we would today call back alley abortionists. So this was a very dangerous thing and a pretty horrible thing. Uh, what Mill says though, uh, and I don't know if you can transplant that into contemporary times, but what Mill says um, is as follows, that over your mind and body, uh, you are sovereign. The individual, Mill says, and I'm quote, um, or paraphrase, that the individual is sovereign over his own mind and body. So in other words, nobody can tell you what to do with your mind and nobody can tell you what to do with your body. Mill said that. Um, and, and so understand, Mill is saying this, in, and he said it on liberty, in On Liberty, right? That over in 1859, he's saying you are sovereign over your, in other words, you're the ruler of your mind and body. So if he's saying that, then certainly that could be interpreted as saying that he is pro-choice, wouldn't you, wouldn't you think? Yes, yes. Perfect. Because that's obviously, I just want 
Right, but that's that's a good question. That's why I'm saying to you, I'm only giving I'm only giving you Mill's literal words. He's saying over your mind and body, in his view of liberty, part of what liberty means is that you're in charge of your mind and you're in charge of your body, nobody else. So that certainly, and it can fast forward to today, to me, that would imply pro-choice. And I'm not saying whether I'm pro-choice or pro-life. I'm saying what Mill is saying would imply that if you're sovereign over your mind and body, then that seems like an endorsement uh, to me. That sounds like an endorsement of pro-choice, right? Okay. Uh, because pro-choice is based on the maxim that uh, a woman is sovereign over her body. So that's exactly what Mill said in 1859. All right. Um, which is one of the reasons why you, you would call him one of the first progressives. Are we clear? Okay. Um, it's very interesting. Yes, Ahmed, he's very interesting. And we're going to get even, we're going to get even more interesting in a moment, but yeah, it's impossible to know. I mean, what, but some words have pretty much retained their meaning. Uh, although the social situations change and because technologies change, they allow us to do things today, you know, technologically with medical technologies, we can do things which would have been inconceivable a hundred years ago, or, you know, 160 years ago when Mill is writing, but even so, uh, the, the, the interesting thing for us is to see to what extent these principles can be applied in, in our contemporary lives. Yeah, that's the interesting challenge is to see how elastic uh, and how robust these principles are. Uh, so that uh, do they really mean the same thing today as they meant, for example, when Mill articulated them? And I think some of them do. All right. So let's let's continue. Any more questions before we dive into Mill? All right. Well, we're going to he's going to raise more. I promise. You know, you're going to Mill will raise more questions momentarily. So uh, let's go there. I want to share with you uh, the uh, the extract from utilitarianism. That's where we'll begin this morning. Um, and then I'm going to look, remember the goal this morning is to look at the overall uh, precept of utilitarianism as he formulates it, and then to entertain two strong objections. The first one he answers in the extract you're going to see and read, hopefully, if you haven't already. And the second objection is very, very powerful. And he answers it in this other essay on liberty. So that's my challenge for you this morning to uh, understand his basic theory and to see how he responds to those two objections. Okay, so let's go there. Um, I'm going to share the screen with you um, if I can. There it is. Just just tell me verbally. Do you see you see utilitarianism, right? Yes. The text. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So those are his dates. Uh, leading exponent of utilitarianism. He's also uh, an empiricist, <laughs> uh, but a much more modern one. Um, and um, so uh, happiness uh, for Mill, as the introduction tells you, is, the, is pleasure, basically, and the privation of pain, meaning the absence of pain. And unhappiness is pain or suffering, either way. Pain, you know, could be physical pain or, or could be psychological or emotional pain. That's all pain as far as Mill is concerned. Anything unpleasant is painful. Um, and the privation, uh, meaning deprivation or, or uh, dearth of pleasure. So uh, Mill goes on to, to redefine, actually not to refine, but to redefine pleasure. Um, and this is to rescue his theory from the earlier version by Jeremy Bentham, his mentor which attracted uh, accusations of hedonism uh, because, because the, the, you know, what Bentham did was to uh, talk about happiness as pleasure. And when, when Bentham did that, he's talking about Bentham uh, as quantitative utilitarianism because Bentham is saying that we want the greatest happiness for the greatest number in terms purely of pleasure. So people immediately accuse Bentham of being a hedonist because he says, well, if you're chasing a lot of pleasure, if, if, if happiness is pleasure, then on that view, said the critics, the more pleasure you get, the more happy you are. And therefore, basically, everybody should be a hedonist and spend, spend their lives chasing pleasure. And there's obviously something wrong with that as a moral doctrine. Uh, because chasing our own pleasure can end up, you know, inflicting pain on others, aside from the fact that 
pleasure is uh, something subject subject to diminishing return. That is, whatever brings you pleasure today may bring you less pleasure tomorrow. So you're going to need more of it. Uh, and there may be a ceiling on how much pleasure you can experience. And then there's this very curious business with humans, and that is that, uh, you know, uh, attraction turns to aversion. So if you if you ate your favorite meal uh, once in a while, it would certainly bring you pleasure, right? But if you ate your favorite meal three times a day, I'll bet you'd start to dislike it. <laughs> if you were forced to eat your favorite meal <laughs> three times a day, in the end, you'd probably become averse to it. So what brings you happiness today may bring you happiness tomorrow if we define it only in terms of pleasure. And that was the problem that, that you know, Bentham's theory attracted. Uh, although Bentham, Bentham's book you can read for yourselves, and it's the earlier book also called Utilitarianism. So Mill took it upon himself to rescue Bentham's theory or Bentham's formulation from this charge, and he refined the theory to talk about pleasure in terms of its quality and not simply its quantity, and that satisfied a lot of the critics. Okay, so that's the first criticism, and uh, he says something interesting here. Um, um, that questions of ultimate ends, says Mill, are not amenable to direct proof. Whatever can be pr proved to be good must be so by being shown to be a means to something admitted to be good without proof. For example, the medical art is proved to be good by its conducing to health. But how is it possible to prove that health is good, right? Nobody ever sits down and attempts to prove that health is good. We just somehow help ourselves to the very reasonable assumption that most people would prefer to be healthy than unhealthy, right? That health is a natural thing or a natural state which is disrupted by illness. And the medical art is supposed to not only cure illness, but restore health, right? Um, good medical art uh, is going to conduce to health. And presumably, we all think that health is good. We don't ever prove that health is good. But if most people would prefer to be healthy rather than unhealthy, we can kind of help ourselves to the assumption that health is good. And therefore, medical arts must be good because they're helping us to attain that greater good. Okay, is that clear? Similarly, he argues the art of music is good for the reason, among others, that it produces pleasure, right? We love, people love listening to music. Sure, listening to music produces pleasure, but what proof is it possible to give that pleasure is good? Well, the only quote unquote proof we can give is that most people would naturally prefer pleasure to pain, would naturally choose pleasure to pain, just as most people would naturally choose health to ill health, good health to ill health, right? So that's not a proof but it's a very strong indication. Similarly, most people would probably prefer liberty to tyranny. I'm not sure about that, but uh, nonetheless, uh, Mill's argument goes, goes forward on this basis, all right? And let's finish the thought, and we'll come back and discuss things, but I wanna get to a very important point here. Um, and this is where he formulates the greatest happiness principle, or rather reformulates Bentham's version, okay? The foundation of morals is utility, or the greatest happiness principle, that's where utilitarianism gets its name. Um, and it holds that actions are right in proportion as they tend to promote happiness. And that's yours and everybody else's. It's not just exclusively your happiness. It's not ethical egoism saying, do whatever you do to make yourself happy. That's ethical egoism. Mill is saying greatest happiness, meaning your act is right in, insofar as it promotes happiness among all concerned, okay? Yourself for sure, and others also. So you can't make yourself happy at the expense of other people. This, this would not be utilitarian, okay? But if uh, you, your act uh, promotes as much happiness as possible, then uh, in proportion to that, it would be considered to be right. And, uh, and of course, the flip side is if your act it, it promotes as much unhappiness uh, as possible, then it would be deemed to be wrong. So that's utilitarian. You see, it's focused entirely on consequences, right? It's not saying acts themselves are inherently right or wrong. It's saying acts are adjudged to be right or wrong, respectively, in terms of how much happiness or unhappiness they produce. Okay, that's that's a obviously a, a, a very key feature of consequentialist theories of ethics, and in particular, in this case, of the utilitarian branch of that theory. Okay. By happiness is intended pleasure and the absence of pain, and by unhappiness, pain and the privation or absence of pleasure. Now he has to go on immediately 
to entertain the objection that was made against Bentham when he basically rehearsed the same theory, but treated happiness as a quantitative thing rather than a qualitative thing. So he says, such a theory of life excites in many minds and among them in some of the most estimable in feeling and purpose inveterate dislike. There are people who objected to this and very respectable people objected to it. Why? To suppose that life has, as they express it to the critics, right? No higher end than pleasure, no better and nobler object of desire and pursuit, they designate as utterly mean and groveling, as a doctrine worthy only of swine, to whom the followers of Epicurus were, at a very early period, contemptuously like. And Epicurus proposed a similar thing in the ancient world, and it was also condemned as ultimately hedonism. So, uh, or modern uh, holders of the doctrine are occasionally made the subject of equally polite comparisons. That's, that's, our, that's sarcastic, right? Equally polite. Comparing somebody to a swine is not polite. This is irony. By German, French, and English critics. So when thus attacked, uh, the Epicureans have always answered that it is not they, but their accusers who represent human nature in a degrading light. Since the accusation supposes human beings to be capable of no pleasures except those of which swine are capable. So you see the, the, uh, the response to this criticism says, wait a second, you're telling us that because we're interested in the greatest happiness and that happiness is pleasure, you're saying that we're behaving like swine? Uh, no, because, because we're human beings, we're not swine, and therefore as human beings, we're capable of much nobler pleasures qualitatively than, than animals are capable of. And so it's a very different thing. This, this accusation will therefore not wash. It's not hedonism at all, says Mill. And here, here's uh, the answer uh, in, more, in more depth. It is quite compatible, he says, with the principle of utility to recognize the fact that some kinds of pleasures are more desirable and more valuable than others. Okay? It would be absurd that while in estimating all other things, quality is considered as well as quantity. The estimation of pleasures should be supposed to depend on quantity alone. So, so Mill is saying, wait a second, we're talking about pleasure not with the same uh, voice that we would talk about animal pleasures, but, none, but with a human voice where we can enjoy things that the animals can't, other animals can't enjoy. So quickly to th think about this, if we talk about just humans, the pleasures of a three-year-old or obviously qualitatively not as advanced as the pleasures of an eight-year-old or a 10-year-old, right? When you're three years old, you know, what's pleasurable for you is much simpler, correct? Then when you get to be an older child and then your pleasures can take on a, a more sophisticated range, presumably. And then when you're an adolescent, your pleasures will presumably then expand further. And when you're a young adult, as most of you may be, uh, you, will, you will have a more sophisticated notion of pleasure. You'll have more understanding of arts, for example, and of other things, uh, music, of literature, of poetry, of film, of dance. You'll have an appreciation, in other words, of things that you may not have appreciated as a child. We call these things acquired tastes, right? So as we mature, uh, in our, in, in, you know, in our growth, not only as biological beings, but also as social and political beings, we presumably also mature in our tastes and in our abilities to enjoy pleasures of a kind that children would not necessarily enjoy because they're too young to enjoy them. We call these things acquired tastes. And if you reflect on it, I'll bet that many of you have in your own lives um, changed your tastes. I'll bet you many of you now appreciate things that as perhaps younger children you never did. Okay, so that's what Mill is talking about, qualitative pleasures. And, and he like says- Like coffee. I beg your pardon? I'm saying like coffee, coffee oh, is an yeah, acquired like test. Oh coffee, sure. I mean, we don't give coffee to children normally because they don't need more stimulants, right? But sure, uh, that's one example. And there are many, not only with food. I'm sure lots of you now appreciate foods that you, when you were a kid, you thought were horrible. All right, maybe, but also other higher cultural pursuits that humans engage in, which other animals don't. So that's what Mill is talking about by, by pleasure, that we can take pleasure in a variety of things much, much more 
and much in a much deeper way than than the other animals can. And that's what he means by human happiness. It's obviously a kind of happiness which is much more deeply nuanced and experiences pleasure in a in a more sophisticated way. That's what we're able to do because of our humanity. Okay. All right. Uh, moreover, he says, of two pleasures, if there be one to which all or almost all who have, have experience of both give a decided preference, irrespective of any feeling of moral obligation to prefer it, that is the most desirable one. In other words, it, we need to have experience of both in order to determine which is qualitatively uh, preferable to us. We need to experience the baser, so-called baser pleasures, the animal pleasures, and the more noble pleasures that humans can experience. Of course, anyone who's only experienced one or the other is not a fit judge of which is really uh, more qualitatively conducive to happiness. So essentially, that is his refutation of that of that argument that if if you know the greatest happiness is equivalent to the greatest pleasure, uh, the charge being this is hedonistic. Miller's responding, no, it's not hedonism at all. It's rather the full measure of our capacity as human beings. Yeah. Um, and this one, I should have, I don't know why this isn't highlighted, but it should be. I'm highlighting it now. This is a great, a great passage, a famous passage. Let me conduct a thought experiment with you based on this passage. Mill asserts at the bottom of this page, few human creatures would consent to be changed into any of the lower animals for a promise of the fullest allowance of a beast's pleasures. This is the ultimate refutation of this charge, okay? That, that the greatest happiness principle is simply a principle of hedonism, okay? Few humans would, consult, would consent to be changed into any of the lower animals for a promise of the fullest allowance of a beast's pleasures. No intelligent human being, Mill asserts, would consent to be a fool, no instructed person would be an ignoramus. No person of feeling and conscience would be selfish and base, even though they should be persuaded that the fool, the dunce, or the rascal is better satisfied with his lot than they are with theirs. So let me conduct a thought experiment with you. Would any of you, and there's no right or wrong answer, I'm just curious, would any of you rather be a different animal? If you could live you know, the, the, the most pleasurable possible life of that animal, OK, given, you know, whatever that animal's limitations are, uh, would you rather be some other animal than a human? Go ahead, type it in the chat room. Nope. OK, no, no, it's OK. I oh, In every class, I want to say most of you are saying, ah, oh, some of you. There's always some people who would rather be some other animal. OK, I'm curious. Would you share with us <laughs> which other animal you'd rather be than human? A tiger, a rhino. Okay, well, I wouldn't want to be poached uh, for my for my for my horns. Okay, if I had any, a dog. What kind of a dog, Luis? Would you would you rather? Somebody said dog. Brandon, what kind of a dog would you rather be? A hawk, a bear, a monkey. Well, this class is quite exceptional. A raccoon. My goodness. Animals have limited thinking capacity, so life is much less troublesome. Well, Ahmed, you know, this is exactly contrary to Mill. I have to congratulate you for running a theory, uh, for running a thesis. This is the, the, the direct opposite, because Mill at the bottom of this page asserts, and obviously you don't agree, it is better to be a human being dissatisfied than a pig satisfied, says Mill. Why does he say that? Why does Mill assert that it's better to be a human being dissatisfied than a pig satisfied? Because, he says, and I'll answer for him, because if you're a human being dissatisfied, you have the possibility of becoming satisfied in a human way. And human satisfaction, the kind of satisfactions that humans are capable of, are much greater qualitatively than the kinds of satisfactions that a pig is capable of. And therefore, it's better to be a human dissatisfied with the understood, the capacity to become satisfied, the opportunity to become satisfied, than simply a pig satisfied. So, uh, you know, that's the uh, tigers are apex, Luis. Yes, tigers are apex, but not quite. Tigers are apex in the, in the forests in which they still survive. In fact, they're endangered right now. Tigers are an endangered species. Uh, and, and who are they endangered by? Us, that's right. So I guess we're apex. We're the apex predator on all predators. We're super predators. 
Okay, so back to this idea. Dogs are always happy, says Brandon, and I want to be happy. And Mill would say to you, if I may attempt to speak for him, of course you want to be happy. That's a, that's, that's a normal thing for people to want to be happy. How long does a dog live? Mm. On average, what, even if a dog lives to old age, how many years? 12 to 16. About 15, that would be extremely old for a dog. That would be like 100, right? It's about seven years. You know, a dog's life is about seven years, right? Uh, uh, faster than a human's life. So a dog that's, that's 10 years old is like 70 for a human. A dog that's 15 years old would be 105 for a human. That would be as old as they could get. Um, so a dog is happy, but not for very long. If you attain human, if you attain human happiness... Mill would say you could ha and you had a full human life expectancy you'd have maybe 60 70 80 90 years of happiness in human measure and of a greater qualitatively greater happiness than a dog's happiness and much much more of it so therefore it's better to be a human you get the argument whether you agree with it or not it's another matter uh, this class you guys have set a record for the number of animals you'd rather be i have to tell you you've set a record OK, everything is fleeting, Brandon. Everything is fleeting. Life is fleeting. OK, and that's because we have a conception of time and maybe other animals don't. Uh, but everything is fleeting. And so even that lends weight. If everything is fleeting, then better to enjoy a higher quality for a briefer time than a lower quality for a longer time. That's what Mill would say. OK, better to eat smaller portions of delicious food than larger portions of junk food. Is what Mill would say. Okay, uh, this class has definitely set a record for uh, for the number of other animals you'd rather be. So if you ever get a chance, I'm going to recommend a book to you. I'll type it in. It's called The Once and Future King. The Once and I don't know if anybody's read this. It's a work of literature by T. H. White. It's called The Once and Future King. And it's a it's a it's a fictional account of the life of Arthur and Lancelot and Guinevere and Camelot, you know, that whole mythical episode of King Arthur and the sword and the stone and the great knight Lancelot and the love triangle between or among rather Arthur and uh, uh, Guinevere and, and Lancelot. It's kind of tragic story as well, but it's a very beautiful story. And when Arthur was a young boy. He was tutored by a wizard. He had the great good fortune to have as a teacher Merlin. Okay, Merlin the wizard was his teacher as a young boy. And I'm telling you this because there's a whole big episode, there's a whole chunk of education in the book where Merlin the wizard turns Arthur the boy into a number of different animals so that he could get to lead temporarily the lives of these different animals and understand what it's like to be an animal rather than a human. So Merlin changes him into a hawk, into a fish, into an ant, into a variety of animals, and then brings him back. And the lesson that Arthur learns from being changed into all these animals is primarily that it's much better to be human. And he comes back to his human form, always with tremendous relief that he's actually a human. So I guess that's in accord with Mill's point. OK, better a human, Dis even a human dissatisfied than a pig satisfied. Better to be Socrates dissatisfied than, he says, a fool satisfied. And if the fool or the pig are of a different opinion, it is because they know only their own side of the question. Like a pig cannot imagine what it's like to be a human. A fool cannot imagine what it's like to be Socrates. The other party to the company knows both sides. So Mill is saying, you're much better off if you know both sides of the story always. Okay. So uh, I'm glad this uh, has already provoked a lot of uh, discussion among you. And I want you all to do a thought experiment. Those of you who would rather be hawks or tigers or, or, or dogs or, or all these uh, rhinos or tigers or whatever other animals you've, you've, you've chimed in with, think about this. Uh, imagine that Merlin were here in the room and could change you into any of those animals, but wouldn't change you back. He would have to make the change irreversible, okay? So Merlin appears and says, okay, you'd rather be a rhino. I'll, I could change you into a rhino or you'd rather be a tiger or a dog or a hawk or whatever. I can change you into that. But you can't come back as a human. If you take that pill, you know, you're going to be that animal with that animal's problems and that animal's lifespan and that animal's capacities. 
So how many of you would really go for it, okay? Um, you want to think about this maybe very carefully. How many of you would really immediately and irrevocably choose to be a different animal? Mill thinks not that many would, okay? So one of the other points, and then I'll come back to the room with you for a moment, that one of these other points is, a and this is Mill's view of education and the importance of education. And it harkens back to, to something that, um, um, okay, so most of you were saying not, not if it were permanent. Okay, so it might be fun for a day. I agree, it might be interesting, but not if it was permanent. Okay, now someone, Alejandro, now has picked out a panda. Um, gee whiz, but you know, you have to eat nothing but eucalyptus. You got to spend most of your time. Yeah, you can chill. Well, relatively speaking, but I mean, pandas are spending all of their waking hours eating because the nutritional value of the eucalyptus is so low that they have to stuff themselves with eucalyptus leaves on a daily basis just in order to maintain their, their caloric intake. So, um, I mean, I'm not so sure that's great. Okay. Oh yeah. No paying taxes anymore. All right. Well, I'm glad this is all this is all making you um, think. Okay, animals don't have to worry about unemployment or coronavirus. That's right, that's right. They don't have to worry about those things. Uh, but then again, as Mill says, I keep returning to this. That's why I highlighted the quote for you: "Better to be uh, Socrates dissatisfied than a fool satisfied," because if you're Socrates dissatisfied, then you can finally attain satisfaction and it will be of a very high quality when you do, okay? And the importance of education is highlighted very much like Aristotle. Mill is uh, hugely emphatic about this. How do we then learn to distinguish between, let us say, nobler and baser feelings? Or how do we acquire these qualitatively more sophisticated, more highly nuanced tastes that really at the end of the day distinguish humans from other animals. Mill thinks education is the way to do it. So he says here, capacity for nobler feelings is in most natures a very tender plant, easily killed, not only by hostile influences, but by mere want of sustenance. And in the majority of young persons, it speedily dies away if the occupations to which their position in life has devoted them and the society into which it has thrown them are not favorable to keeping that higher capacity in exercise. You see, so when we're born, we don't have a choice, right, as to our situations in life, not immediately. And whatever we're thrown into, as Mill phrases it, whatever, however the circumstances are that we're thrown into, we're going to be fortunate. And in fact, it's necessary for us to receive a way of developing the full extent of our humanity. Otherwise, it will be like a tender plant. Our capacity for it, nobler feeling will be easily killed by hostile influences if indeed uh, we're not subjected to a nurturing and, and, and an enculturating environment. So education becomes very important um, from Mill's point of view as well. Um, okay, and that's one of the reasons why he crusaded against child labor laws in England at the time, which were still in force and so forth. He wanted children to be exposed to um, a much higher standard of, and a higher quality of life right from the beginning. So they would be able then to develop their full human potential. And that's what Mill wants. The greatest happiness for the greatest number means also the development of human potential for the greatest number. Okay. So what if a person is born with a mental handicap? That's a really good question, Ahmed. If a person is born with a mental handicap, we owe them care. We owe them the chance to be the, the best humans that they can be. All right. So Mill would still say they're maybe not going to be fully autonomous. Depends on the nature of the handicap. Right. But, for example, we used to view Down syndrome as a kind of a terrible curse and very often infants or rather not infants, but 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 fetuses diagnosed with Down syndrome uh, were aborted because it was thought to be a burden on the parents and, and, and that handicap that would be severely limiting on the child. But now we've changed our view. We've, we've, we realize that people born with Down syndrome can in fact lead very qualitatively 
great lives, even though they have certain handicaps from our point of view, they're not unhappy to have been born. They'd rather be born if you ask them. They're happy to be, you know, a human. They're happy to be alive with Down syndrome rather than dead, rather than, you know, killed. So um, Mill would say that people who have handicaps can still achieve qualitatively great things. Don't forget Beethoven had a great handicap. He was deaf when he composed the greatest music of his career. So, you know, what one person views as a handicap uh, may in fact not be a handicap at all. So Mill, Mill is very egalitarian in his wanting to help everybody be as autonomous as they can be. Okay. Recognizing, of course, that not everyone's going to be the same. Fair enough. So this is the uh, way in which Mill answers the charge that the greatest happiness for the greatest number is only hedonism. That's one charge. Uh, and, and he spends in your extract uh, a very considerable amount of time uh, refuting that charge. And finally, I wanna get to what he calls the ultimate sanction of his doctrine, chapter four, um, and the proof of it uh, is what I want to close this part with, and then we'll turn to on liberty. Uh, this is a very important point you can read Again, you must read uh, because uh, there's quite a bit going on. Of what sort of proof, he asks, is the principle of utility susceptible? What sort of proof? Well, the only proof he repeats something that he's, he began with in a different way. Consider this. The only proof capable of being given that an object is visible is what? Is that people can actually see it, right? Mills and empiricists, remember, right? The only proof that a sound is audible is what? Is that people can hear it. Right, this is common sense, yes? And so of the other sources of our experience. In like manner, I apprehend, the sole evidence that it is possible to produce anything that is desirable is that people do actually desire it. And once again, he's saying that most people desire happiness. And so that the greatest happiness principle is for him going to remain the foundation of morality, okay? So that's the first uh, charge against his thesis, the charge of hedonism. And you have what we've looked at briefly, and you should consider in more depth uh, Mill's response to it. Now there's a second charge, as I said, and I'm gonna spend the remaining time beginning to answer Mill's, uh, in, you know, Mill's response. I'm going to summarize for you Mill's response. The second charge in a way is more damning. Uh, and I think you'll be able to see it very quickly. Uh, so here's the second accusation. And it has as follows. I want to stop the share now. Come back to the room. So the first accusation is that utilitarianism is hedonism and Mill answers this, I think, pretty decisively. The second accusation is very serious and potentially lethal. And Mill has to answer it. And he does. Uh, and he did so two years before publishing utilitarianism. He did so in his essay on liberty. The charge is as follows. The objection is as follows. If we're talking about the greatest happiness for the greatest number, what are we saying about the smallest number? In other words, the greatest happiness for the greatest number could also entail the, the greatest misery for the smallest number, right? We're not talking about everybody. Mill is not utopian. He's not saying that we're going to be able to make everybody happy. Mill knows that in any society, you're never going to make everybody happy. No matter what you do, there are always going to be people who will, who will be unhappy. Nobody can make everybody happy. No political system has ever made everybody happy. The best we can do, Mill says, is the greatest happiness for the greatest number. If you think about it, we can imagine utopian societies, but we've never created one in all of human civilization. Whatever we create politically and socially, we will always find people who will be made unhappy by one aspect or another. So Mill is saying we can only achieve the greatest happiness for the greatest number. But again, the accusation is, and it's a very, very serious one, sure, we can achieve the greatest happiness for the greatest number, but that never talks about the corollary cost. Perhaps we're achieving the greatest happiness for the greatest number, at the cost of some great unhappiness or the greatest unhappiness for the smallest number. Yeah? And how do we deal with that? Uh, so is there a, still a hand up? Cal, is that your name, Kale? Is your hand up? 
No. Oh, yeah. Sorry. That was from a while ago. All right. Yeah. Or go, go ahead. Oh, um, I honestly forgot what it was. I'm sorry. Well, okay. Then as we <laughs> say, it couldn't have been that important. If it comes back to ask it again, I hope like you were asking in your breakout session. So yeah, I want to focus on this. All right. This is really important. Can you, let's give me, let me give you a, a, just a, a, an analogy or, or an allegory. Suppose we're, we're all shipwrecked. Suppose we're shipwrecked and suppose there's a lifeboat. The ship, we're, we're all, we're, let's suppose there's 11 of us in a, you know, on a boat and the boat sinks and the lifeboat can only hold 10 people at a time without sinking itself. So there's 10 people going to be in the lifeboat, right? And one person's going to be in the water. Maybe they're hanging on to the lifeboat, but suppose there's sharks in the water. So the person in the water is basically going to be in danger of being eaten by sharks, right? So the 10 people in the lifeboat are all happy, right? I mean, relatively speaking, they've been saved from the boat sinking and they're going to be rescued, let's say, and they have some food and water in the boat. So they're as happy as they can be in the circumstances, right? They're in the life raft and they're going to be okay for a while. And so they have the greatest happiness for the greatest number, don't they? That would be for Mill. That, that's the utilitarian formula, the greatest happiness for the greatest number. What about the person in the water? Maybe that person's getting eaten by a shark. Are they happy? No. Um, but they're only one person. The other 10 are fine. So is this okay? There's a problem, isn't it? Not really? Not really okay, Ahmed. I hope you're saying not really okay. You're not volunteering to be the one in the water, right? Yes, there is a problem, definitely. So how do we solve the problem? If the lifeboat cannot hold 11 people, right? Uh, so someone has to be in the water. So maybe we could take turns, right? Maybe let's say we could agree to take turns. Each of us is going to spend, you know, an hour in the water. Okay. Or if the water's really cold, maybe 10 minutes in the water and we'll continue that way. Okay. So um, wouldn't the person dying make the people unhappy? So it wouldn't be there. That's right, Kirsten. I mean, exactly. You can't be really happy if exactly my point, Kirsten, and Mill's point, that if someone has to die in order for you to be happy, that's not really the greatest happiness at all. Uh, but on the other hand, suppose we all decide that it's okay. Suppose there's somebody that we really don't like for whatever reason who's in that, you know, part of the 11. We say, let's feed this guy to the sharks. Like this guy's obnoxious or this guy's rude or this guy is, oh, I don't know, politically incorrect or this guy is a pain in the ass or whatever. So let's feed this guy to the sharks, okay? So we all feed this guy to the sharks and we're moreover happy about it. So 10 of us in the lifeboat are happy because we got rid of the creep that we don't like. And that guy's getting beaten by the sharks and that's utilitarian. But is it just? And Mill would say no. Mill would say it can't be. It can't be. Okay. And if you want an example, if you want a really scintillating example of that scenario and why that can't be utilitarian, I uploaded in, in your uh, Google Drive folder a very, really a great short story by Ursula Le Guin. Has anybody heard of her? Um, wait a second. I'm going to type her name in. Ursula Le Guin. Has anybody heard of Ursula Le Guin? Okay, there's a there's a short story by her that that's uploaded in your Google Drive folder. It's called The Ones Who Walk Away from Omelas. Okay, The Ones Who Walk Away from Omelas. Now, this is a like science fiction, not really. It's a kind of fiction, but it's a dystopian story. Okay? Omelas is this little town where everything is perfect or you would think Okay, I'm not going to spoil the story, but read it. It's a short story. And it's her exact critique. This is exactly the critique. You're going to discover that everyone in Omelas is leading this utopian life with one exception. And when people discover that the, somehow the cost of their perfect utopian life is this one exception, they're so horrified that they leave Omelas. They can't change it. So they, they can't stand it. So they leave. Okay. And that's, and that's exactly the critique against Mill that utilitarianism, the greatest happiness for the greatest number, never talks about what might happen to the smallest number. Yes, it is an extraordinary story, Jana, but I hope you understand, or now you understand, that 
and I'm not going to spoil the story for the rest of you, but you see it's a critique against this idea of the greatest happiness for the greatest number, because the greatest happiness for the greatest number never necessarily discusses what's happening to the smallest number. So, for example, what if a majority of people oppresses a minority? So the majority is happy. OK, let's say the majority is perfectly happy. Um, but the minority is not because no one wants to be oppressed and a certain minority may be oppressed by a majority. So that's utilitarian, the greatest happiness for the greatest number. But that's going to be a critique of utilitarianism, right? Because you're going to say, wait a second, that means utilitarianism can, can tolerate oppression. Utilitarianism can justify doing things to a small number of people for the sake of the majority. And Mill wants to say no. In, please, I know some of you are going to get this wrong because some people always don't understand this, but Mill's version of utilitarianism does not permit this at all. And, and that's why Mill underwrites something more fundamental, which is individual liberty. Okay, so Mill's answer to that charge would be that everybody has to have individual liberty so that no one's individual rights can be violated in order to make a majority happy. Okay, because in fact, it is completely consonant with the greatest happiness of the greatest number that everyone also enjoys the greatest liberty possible without exception. Because if people don't have liberty, they can't be happy anyway. And so Mill's defense of liberty is essential to his defense of utilitarianism. Is this clear in general? Is it clear in general? What, what I've just said to you? Yeah, okay. So that the greatest happiness for the greatest number can work, says Mill, only if, only if, People cannot be individually oppressed or marginalized for the sake of the majority. That's not going to be work. That's not going to be workable for Mill. Good. I'm glad you get this. That's really important. And that's what marks him off from many utilitarians and uh, what marks him off uh, as a great defender of individual liberty, because without that, he says, we'll never have the greatest happiness of the greatest number. Okay. And where he defends this uh, is in the essay on liberty. And since we're almost out of time, I think that that I'm going to reserve that for my breakout group. Those readings, however, are in your Google Drive folder. So I'll just I'll just basically um, summarize for you what the two other key points are in Mill's defense of the greatest happiness for the greatest number. Number one, that uh, we must have individual liberty and individual rights and that the majority is not allowed to oppress a minority. That's really, really important. And he also talks about something very chilling, which is social tyranny. It's not just political tyranny. Do you know that Mill anticipated cancel culture? I'll just briefly share an extract with you if I can. It's amazing, this extract from On Liberty, where he actually anticipates the possibility of what we today call cancel culture. All right, this is the extract uh, from On Liberty. And uh, it, it's, it's governed by a very important point, and that is that no one uh, can restrain anyone uh, unless they're going to harm another person. The only way that you're allowed to restrain someone's liberty is to prevent them from doing harm. Okay. And what he says is, and this is really interesting, he talks about social tyranny. And if I can come up with that, here it is. He says, reflecting persons perceive that when society is itself the tyrant, so it's not just political tyranny you know, or entrenched tyranny in a political system, it's also possible for there to be social tyranny. And he says this in 1859, when society is itself the tyrant, society collectively over the separate individuals who compose it, by means of tyrannizing are not restricted to acts which, may, uh, which it may do by the hands of political functionaries. Society can and does execute its own mandates. And if it issues wrong mandates instead of right, or any mandates at all in things with which it ought not to meddle, it practices a social tyranny more formidable than many kinds of political oppression, since, though not usually upheld by such extreme penalties, it leaves fewer means of escape, penetrating much more deeply into the details of life and enslaving the soul itself. And I think this is a remarkable and prescient vision of exactly what the cancel culture does. Social tyranny, social media, it's not political, but it's really potentially very damaging and leaves fewer means of escape, doesn't it? If you decide, you know, if, somebody, if somebody's canceled, that person can't escape from it. 
because of social tyranny, not political tyranny. So anyway, that's a really interesting thing, comes up in his essay on liberty. And that other point we took up at the beginning, okay, over himself, you remember the point about abortion that was raised? I think it was Nicole. Over himself, he says, over his own mind, body and mind, the individual is sovereign. So you are sovereign. You are in charge of your body. You are in charge of your mind, not the government and, and, and not anybody else. This is a remarkable thing, uh, even uh, as late as 1859. It's still a remarkable thing to be said. And that's his essay on liberty. And I'm going to treat the fundamental core concept of that in my breakout lecture. It's called the harm principle. That'll be Thursday. And I hope your instructors will do so in your lectures as well. And then finally, and, and again, to remind you of the other thing that's going on with Mill, individual liberty in order to feed his utilitarian theory, and everybody has to have liberty, it applies to women as well as men, obviously. And the other work that I alluded to earlier, namely the subjection of women, is going to call for the complete political and social equality of women. He's calling for that in 1869, and that's a good 50 years before women actually got the vote. But Mill's work was a big, big stepping stone toward that, because he obviously sees that you can't have the greatest happiness of the greatest number if half that number or even a little more than half that number are excluded from having the same rights as the other as the other half. Clear? And along the same line says Kale. Is it Kale or Kale or how do you pronounce your name? OK, um, always along the same. Is it what of economic tyranny? Sure, sure. There's also economic tyranny. And again, the economic tyranny in Mill's day was the economic tyranny of the Industrial Revolution, which had just ridiculously harsh labor laws for children, for women. You know, they were forced to work in mines and factories. There were no, no rights. They had one day off a year. One day off a year. They were looking like 12, 14-hour days for very low wages. Same time as Marx. This is exactly the same time as Marx is proposing his solution, which, of course, is a violent revolution and the attempted elimination of social classes. Uh, Mill's solution is utilitarianism. It's a much milder solution and much more reform inward without overthrowing the whole system, as you can see. So this was a time of great ferment, philosophical ferment, uh, which led to changes in social and political domains. Earth-shaking changes came out of this period. Okay, so economic tyranny was, uh, was understood as being a great social evil also, but it was a different kind perhaps a similar, but yet a different kind of economic tyranny. We have a much better uh, situation today in some respects, and in other respects, we still have a lot of exploitation going on, only sometimes it's more subtle. Okay, excellent question. All right, I'm going to leave it there, uh, but this has been, a, I hope, a useful introduction to John Stuart Mill. And, and again, I remind you, there are three planks that you need to consider his utilitarianism only works if people have individual liberty and that means rights, okay? Which cannot be overridden. And also uh, if uh, we have what today we call gender equality, that is a social and political quality of women uh, to contribute to the greatest happiness for the greatest number. I'm gonna leave Mill there and wish you a very good day and a very good week. Uh, we will uh, uh, conclude our treatment of Mill in our breakout sessions this week. I hope you enjoy your further contemplations of him. Thank you for your engagement today. It's been very interesting, very active. And uh, I'm glad Mill is making you think about all these issues, okay? He's well, well worth investigating his uh, potential solutions to some of these problems. Okay, have a wonderful day. And I'll look forward to seeing you all next Monday when we will uh, take, take on uh, the third section of this course, okay? Our third and final section of the course, Paradoxes and Puzzles. We're gonna, we're gonna have some fun in the third section. All right, take care everybody and see you Same next to week. you, thank you. Yeah, Bye. You're, welcome. you're welcome, good day. I'll stop the recording now. Bye, Professor. Yes, good day everybody. <laughs>